Welcome everybody. In this video, we're going to be learning all about the often forgotten Sintashta culture. So as far as early Bronze Age cultures go, this one was absolutely fascinating, and it's one that doesn't get the credit it deserves. The Sintashta were a descendant culture from what was known as the corded ware culture of Eastern Europe. And the Sintashta would migrate back into Asia into mostly what is today Kazakhstan, where our famous fictional Borat is from. And we would see the Sintashta evolve and intermarry with a lot of nomadic groups during this period to eventually develop into what we know of as the Scythians. So the Sintashta are very much a descendant or ancestral culture for the later Scythians that we would see and become immensely famous. But we're going to focus on the Sintashta in this video, taking a look at their culture and how it would influence the larger major Bronze Age movements that would come to shape most of Bronze Age history as we know it today. Let's begin. According to Russian archaeologists, the Sintashta culture emerged out of members of the corded ware culture migrating from Central and Eastern Europe into modern-day Kazakhstan, where they would intermarry with the already present Poltavka and Abashevo cultures. Now, for a long time, archaeologists believed that the Sintashta were an early version of the Andronovo culture, but we know now, based on material evidence, that the Sintashta were a unique peoples. Now, the Sintashta early on were essentially hunter-gatherers. Uh, they were nomadic people of a mix of steppe ancestry and migrants from Europe. But as modern-day Kazakhstan began to turn because of climate change from wet forests into a drier colder climate, they were forced to establish several permanent settlements, at first small scale, uh, usually about 200 to 700 individuals at each settlement, but later as defensive positions became more unique and more defendable, uh, the Sintashta culture settlements began to grow in size. Most of these defensive positions were on the tops of hills as sort of early hill forts, and they acted as protection for the semi-nomadic Satashta, that in between nomadic grazings of herding cattle and horses and sheep, when there were conflicts between different populations, they could retreat to these hill forts for defense. And this allowed for a unique Sintashta culture to emerge, uh, not just in terms of the culture itself, but also the material remains they leave behind, creating several towns and establishing a unique culture that can be identified from the archaeological record. There were three major aspects to what we know of as the Sintashta culture today from material evidence they left behind. Not only would we see evidence of intense warfare using a combination of both the chariot as a weapon of war, but also an early composite bow used for archery in warfare, but we would also see intense metal production as well as, outside of warfare, the use of a unique language that there's a lot of debates in, in the anthropological including archaeological and linguistic communities over exactly just what language they would have spoken and the influence it would have had on the cultures around them. Let's take a closer look at these three aspects of Sintashta culture, their language, their warfare practices, and their metal production, and learn more about what it can tell us about the people that made up the Sintashta culture. During the era of the Sintashta, there was a lot of 
inter-tribal or inter-village conflict. Now, in some cases, this was entirely peaceful, something similar to the North American potluck tradition, in which rivals often had competing parties, giant feasts where they tried to outdo their competitors in how extravagant of a feast they could host, which is kind of a really cool form of competition, in my opinion. But we do also get a lot of warfare. During this time, we would see the development of the chariot. We'd also see the development of complex arrowheads, complex battle axes, as well as spears. Now, we also have uh, warriors' graves, and we find weapons of these also, but it's probably a lot of ceremonial weapons as the items that we find in these graves have arrowheads made from stone or bone rather than metal, and we also have very small bows that were probably not actually used in warfare. The Santoshta economy revolved around copper metallurgy. Not only would they produce copper itself, but they would also produce a metal known as arsenical bronze. It's a form of bronze alloy which uses arsenic in its production. And this occurred on an industrial scale. The Satasha were producing arsenical bronze and copper like crazy, which made it easy for them to trade with the nearby cultures to their south, like those in modern-day Pakistan and Afghanistan. And it would be through this trade route to the south that the Satasha were able to export their metal goods all the way into the Middle East with ancient civilizations of modern day Iran and Iraq. It was also through this trade throughout that we would see the migration of the chariot move from Central Asia into the Middle East and eventually into ancient Egypt itself. But we would also see horses make that migration through the same trade network. Members of the Sintashta culture had a physical abnormality known as dolichocephalic skulls. This is when the skulls are abnormally longer in comparison or contraction to the width of their skull. Now, dolichocephalic skulls can manifest themselves in a number of hereditary ways, but those specific to the Santashta culture show a very close tie to other cultures around them, specifically the Yamnaya and Poltavka cultures that are sought to be ancestors to the Santashta, but also among some Scythian tribes, which is why a lot of historians believe that the Scythians may be ancestors to a lot of the Scythians showing a really interesting history genetically through the Cordonware culture all the way to the Scythians of the Bronze Age. There have been two major genetic studies done on remains of members of the Satashta culture. In 2015, there were four individuals tested, and the findings showed an extremely close genetic relationship between members of the Santashta culture and members of the Cordonware culture of Central and Eastern Europe. It also showed a very close similarity between those of the Nordic Bronze Age, who were very likely also descendants of the Cordonware culture uh, but who migrated north into Scandinavia rather than east into Central Asia. Another study in 2019 analyzed the remains of several members of the Satashta across multiple sites, actually being one of the largest genetic studies done on members of an individual location. And what they found was a reinforcement of the previous study, an extremely close genetic relationship between those of the Cordonware culture of Central and Eastern Europe. 
But what it also found was some really fascinating information from what may have existed before the Colden Ware. So some of the genetic data showed that what likely happened was that the Corded Ware culture probably came from Central Asia, migrated into Central and Eastern Europe, and that the Santashta culture are a branch of the Corded Ware culture that migrated back into Central Asia, which gives us a really interesting picture of the history of the people that not just were the Santashta, but the ancestry that led to them being where they are and how they got there. There were a lot of cultures in Eastern Europe and Central Asia during the time of the Santashta, but the Santashta give us a really clear picture of a lot of the migration patterns that were happening during the late Chalcolithic and early Bronze Age periods. We saw clear evidence of the Corded Ware culture in Central Europe expanding north and eastward into developing intermarriage relationships with the Yamnaya culture, mostly of modern-day Ukraine, to develop unique cultures in Eastern Europe. But we would also see an expansion of the Corded Ware past Eastern Europe into Central Asia to develop the Sintashta culture, which would intermarry with other Central Asian tribes and identities and cultures to develop a unique culture in their own right that would lay the foundations for some of our more famous Central Asian cultures like the Scythians. But they would also create technological advancements in Central Asia that would make huge impacts on Bronze Age history, particularly in the Middle East. Things like the introduction of the chariot and warfare, the development of the composite bow, and some really excellent metalwork that would lay the foundations not just in warfare for the later Bronze Age, but also for non-war related metalwork as well. So the Satoshita culture certainly does not get anywhere near the attention they deserve, and hopefully you can remember this culture and know where a lot of our Bronze Age fascinating items like chariots and bows and cool metal stuff uh, actually come from.